The Jap drive down the Hankow Canton Railroad forced the evacuation of Heng Yang, 375 miles southeast of Chongqing. At June's end, as the Jap siege of Heng Yang became imminent, activities quickened at headquarters of the 14th Air Force to destroy and evacuate all installations. The Japanese, driving south from Hankow, sought Hang Yang for their most important conquest since Canton and Hankow in 1938. Capture of this important U.S. air base and railway junction would put the Japs in control of the entire Hankow Canton Railway, giving them a through north-south line, and would be an important step in their offensive to cut China in two. As coolies dug holes in the runways they sweated to build, GIs prepared bomb fuses. Bombs laboriously flown over the hump blew up the very fields from which they were to have been delivered to the Japs. Half-pound blocks of TNT were shaved to fit into the nose and detonate the thousand-pounders. Here, the demolition squads blasted the field, while a few days later, American planes returned and dropped more thousand-pounders on this field, completing its destruction. Quartermaster and Air Service Command buildings, hostels, operations, radio tower, everything was set afire. As jeeps and personnel were ferried to roads leading to safety, the battered Chinese hung on to the city. The raft was a section of bridge, one of many that heavy rains had washed out. Landslides also blocked progress. At Lingling Ling Airfield, 79 miles southwest of Hengyang, everything was made ready in case evacuation of this base was necessary too. Bombs were buried for demolition of the runway, were placed at every culvert and bridge. Those not needed for demolition were taken to the river along with gas drums and loaded on sampans. And all were moved again as the Japs continued to push south, bypassing Heng Yang after leaving strong forces to beleaguer it. Refugees and vehicles waited to be ferried across the swollen Siang River and proceed by train to the safety of the city of Guilin, still farther southwest. The ferry boat was swept downstream and damaged. By the time it was in operation again, this crowd had grown and it took many days to get the caravan across. At Guilin, provisional capital of Guangxi province, Chinese authorities had ordered evacuation also. It had become a choked crossroads for refugees streaming from the east to escape the Jap pincers that were rapidly closing from Hengyang to the north and Canton to the south. Locomotives were out of coal and many trains were stalled along the single track line leading southwest. On July 7th, serious danger to Guilin was removed when the Chinese managed to break the Hengyang Sea. But despite furious seesaws for battle positions, Heng Yang fell to the Japs on August 9th after a six-week siege. Coolies worked to repair the American-held Guilin base after a Jap attack had damaged the strip and some planes parked on the field. By the middle of August, the Chinese still fought bitterly to retake Heng Yang and keep the Japs from closing the gap to Canton. And the 14th Air Force fought with them.
On Guadalcanal, a radio-controlled model plane gives anti-aircraft crews realistic target practice. Designed and produced by the Air Corps, the OQ-2A radio-controlled airplane target is one-third the size of a pursuit plane and develops approximately one-third the speed, about 100 miles an hour. It's launched by means of a catapult and is flown by remote control from the ground. The plane is wound back on the catapult and the release catch is fastened to hold it in position. From the radio transmitting car in the background, the radio man brings the control box to give the plane a pre-flight check. It has only stabilizer and rudder controls and is flown at constant speed. Nevertheless, it is extremely maneuverable, sensitive to the slightest movement of the stick on the control box. The parachute release is tested next. The chute button is pressed, releasing a lid atop the fuselage where the chute is packed. The plane's radio is also contained here. The plane can be landed on a runway, but landing by chute is more practical. The effects of torque are overcome by the use of contra-rotating propellers. RPMs are checked with a stroboscope. The blades of the stroboscope rotate at a known rate, and when the props appear to stand still, their speed is the same as the stroboscope's. This is the only means of bringing the engine to the proper RPM. Catapulted as the release cord is pulled, the plane flies out over gun positions on the beach. A 40 millimeter Bofors with forward area open sights gets the range of the plane. 50 caliber machine guns and 90 millimeter anti-aircraft guns are also used in this target practice. Anti-aircraft crews throughout this Pacific theater come to the anti-aircraft artillery combat center for refresher courses in gunnery and to become acquainted with new types of weapons. As tracers strike home, the model plane spins in the sky. Before it goes out of control, it's flown over the takeoff point at an altitude of about 150 feet. As the parachute is released, the engine stops and the plane floats down, generally intact except for bullet holes. But this time, it comes to grief in a palm grove. However, it's carried back to a complete repair shop where the highly trained radio plane group will put it back in flying condition. Air Force engineers construct the first tar paper landing strip in France. Trucks with trailers rigged as laying machines spread the tar paper over the runway after steamrollers have smoothed the ground. As the tar paper passes over a roller mounted on the trailer, the underside is moistened with a solution of 75% gasoline and 25% diesel oil to make it adhesive. The truck driver guides himself along the edge of the previously laid strip by a rod projecting from the bumper. As the tar paper runs out, fresh rolls are lifted onto the spindles. The new paper is threaded through the rollers and the laying process continues. As the paper streams from the trailer, men follow to check and adjust it on the runway. Cross seams are closed with liberal applications of the adhesive mixture. A rubber tired roller now smooths and seals it.
Steel mesh is then laid over the tar paper to reinforce it. Called Hash and Runway, after the name of the tar paper strips, this 5,000 foot field was covered in the record time of 17 hours. It will be used by both the AAF and the RAF. Woman has lost everything but her life. Her four sons, her house, her garden, even her shoes. This mother is crying because her husband is dead. She and her child are destitute. These children have nothing left but the bundles they were able to load into a broken down wagon. These are the wanderers of the world today. They have no place to go. Just away from the blackened ruin which was once a home. Away from the stinking corpse which was once a father or a husband. These people are refugees. And refugees are a military problem. In their tragic bewilderment, they clog our supply and communication lines, create confusion, spread disease. The very old, the very young, the homeless, the days. The Germans have their own methods of dealing with such a problem. Bullets have been very effective. So has barbed wire. But we believe in different methods. We believe in taking these homeless and weary people out of the storm of war. We use ships built for attack on errands of mercy. At first, the refugees are timid of our soldiers and sailors. In the past, uniforms have spelled disaster for them. Black shirts, brown shirts. Now, all of draft, but no stormtrooper ever helped a mother off an LCI. This man, who made a good living as a pottery worker in San Pietro, didn't object to the delousing gun. He had no desire to bring germs and lice to the men who were fighting the army, which had destroyed his factory and home and family. The kids aren't quite sure what's happening. All they know is that the dreaded noise of bombs and airplanes is missing and their elders don't cry as much as they did. And yet, many of them can't understand where their father or mother is. And the friend of the family who is taking care of them doesn't want to explain. After a while, the machinery to help begins to move. Sweaters, pants, skirts, coats from attics and closets in England and America. These people will not forget. Next comes questioning. Names, dates, places. When did you last see your son? What is your daughter's first name? Families are brought together. And enemy agents are ferreted out of the mass of refugees. Finally, food. Food at a table, warming and comforting. The grandmothers, the mothers, the children. They eat, and slowly the nightmare begins to disappear. The little things of life go on again. A woman knits. The big things go on, too. A woman has a baby. After processing, the refugees move on to resettlement camps in the south of Italy, where they will wait until the day comes when they can return to rebuild their towns, and their houses, and their lives. These men and women in Italy are but a handful of the millions of refugees we'll meet in France and Holland and Belgium and wherever the Nazis have conquered. And in each country, we'll solve the problem in the same way. A man named Hitler put tears in this little girl's eyes. Now millions of men 
are fighting to put a smile back on her face. Nazi heads look normal enough on the outside, but what makes these heads different is what goes on inside. This little thinking machine specializes in perfecting methods of destruction, and it's dished up some honeys. With these, they destroy men, ships, and cities. But the most ingenious weapon that this brain has perfected is this. The Nazis developed this weapon in peacetime. The German citizen was the guinea pig. He poured the stuff on, and if his right arm went up, he was certified as a member of the great master race. Others weren't eligible inferior races. Not good enough to breathe the same air as Adolf Hitler. The church was opposed to this, so the church was removed. And a new thing was worshipped, with a lot of mumbo-jumbo about Nordic Aryan supermen. The weapon had worked at home. Now it could go to work abroad. Prepare the ground for military conquest. Fertilize the soil for the Quislings. A weapon of war. Play country against country. Look out. Look out for that country behind you. Look out for the Poles. Look out for the French. Don't trust the English. Beware the Russians. A weapon of war. Play religion against religion, turn Protestant against Catholic, and both against Jew. A weapon of war. Play race against race. Aryan, 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 this Aryan, race, that Aryan. race, this race, that race, this race, that race, this race. And that... fear and suspicion, prejudice and hatred had done their work in Europe. Split up for Nazi conquest. And as the great blonde Superman rode victoriously through Europe, his great blonde Aryan friend from Rome, and his great super blue-eyed Nordic Aryan friend from Japan, joined him in great blonde super thoughts of conquests to come. The United States, united? A hodgepodge country of all races, 61 nationalities, and 259 different religious creeds. Here, they thought, were jealousies and prejudices to play upon. Here was the perfect setup for their plan. Divide and conquer. Here was the stuff. First, dress up the product for the American market. And then... Step right up, ladies and gentlemen, and get your bottle here. The one and only Dr. Hitler's blood tonic. Every drop is guaranteed. Is your system sluggish? Try the world's most famous purge. Take home a bottle. Are you high, strung, and irritable? Do you lie awake nights and worry about Armenians, Peruvians, Scandinavians, and Greeks? Try a bottle and you'll lick any foreigner in town. You know those Poles who live on Cedar Street, the Irish down on Hickory Street, the Swedes who live on Chestnut Street, the Negroes out on Maple Street, that Mexican family on Mulberry Street. Take a bottle, you'll be amazed what you can do. Friends, don't forget that you, and you, and you, are much better people than you, and you, and you. Do others take advantage of your easy-going nature? Are you chronically annoyed by Catholics, Baptists, Methodists, or perhaps Episcopalians? Are Jews or Presbyterians a constant irritation? Friends, this bottle is the answer to all your aches and troubles. Step right up. It's the buy of your lifetime. Did I say buy? Friends, it's a gift. 
Step right up, folks. Get them while they last. Well, folks, how about it? Come on, folks. What do you say? What do you say? What do you say? <gasps> Yeah. <laughs>